Uh, hey everyone, thanks for coming. Uh, we'll have a somewhat different panel now. Uh, not driving towards liquidity as much, uh, but more towards uh, vertical integration in the space is essentially what uh, enables DeFi to function. But uh, to kick it off, uh, my name is Marin. I'm contributing to Lido DAO uh, as Master Protocol Relations. Uh, Lido is a middleware on Ethereum blockchain, which Sorry guys, can you please just turn it down for a bit while you're leaving? Thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, it's a middleware on Ethereum blockchain which essentially connects two types of users, node operators uh, and stakers. Uh, currently sitting at around $22 billion TVL and uh, it's a primitive of DeFi. Yeah, so yeah, I'm Erwin, um, basically from like OKX. Uh, we are one of the uh, world's largest exchange. Uh, and you know, of course, one of the main sponsors of 2049, so you might run into uh, many of us really soon. Um, yeah, but essentially what I do at uh, OKX is uh, mainly like DeFi. Um, and of course, like we are supporting you know, protocols like uh, Lido, Stadder, um, and of course Gearbox and um, CN as well. So pretty much like, you know, uh, one of the things that our CEO always says is that uh, DeFi will eat the world. And yeah, I think genuinely uh, as a company, as OKX, like, we do believe that that you know, um, DeFi is the programmability of like money, which is the basis of like you know, crypto in itself, right? Uh, I mean, I think in the previous panels we talked about like you know, uh, things like data, etc. Those are great, but if we go back to the basic principles on why Bitcoin was like started, right? Uh, I think like DeFi is the future of uh, crypto. Hey, my name is Ilgis, uh, Gearbox. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of Gearbox. Uh, Gearbox is a model lending infrastructure. And uh, how we're building it is quite different from uh, existing pool-based lendings. Uh, it's uh, based on a uh, uh, smart wallet way so that uh, you can enable credit inside the wallet uh, in one click. Uh, so our focus to improve uh, UX uh, of lending in DeFi space to build all these composable uh, different use cases and enable it to end users. Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Amit. I'm one of the co-founders of uh, Stata Labs and uh, KelpDAO. Stata is a liquid staking platform live across uh, uh, four plus blockchains, over $400 million in TVL and uh, 50 plus DeFi integrations. Hi everyone, uh, it's Luffy. Um, I'm the founder of KM. We launched KM about two and a half years ago as a yield strategy platform. Um, I'm a Polygon and a bunch of other networks, including Ethereum mainnet. And recently we upgraded the entire platform to what we call a yield layer. We define a domain of yield layer, which um, is a virtual layer that consolidates yield sources across the entire crypto spaces and then redistribute all those yield sources consolidated to different assets from our protocol partners, including, I mean, all the uh, mainstream LSTs. And we um, leverage almost all the DeFi primitives and the CFI markets to generate yield for our partners. So uh, the objective of yield layer is essentially um, to facilitate a sustainable growth of our partners' assets their TVL and on-chain liquidity, rather than, I mean, um, rather than allowing our, I mean, partners relying purely on their internal yield sources, like their uh, governance tokens and uh, profits to incentivize their growth. Perfect, thank you. Uh, so to kick it off, uh, we'll go a bit back in history because uh, protocols here range all the way back to 2020 as well. So. Uh, we can say we have DeFi OGs, uh, but a lot of change from that. Uh, infrastructure uh, is much better now. But, uh, giving, let's just go back for a couple of years. What improved in terms of infrastructure uh, that enabled you to do what you do today? Uh, and what are you doing to improve the UX? Because DeFi in general is very complex for an average user. Uh, so on a protocol level, what did you do to attract uh, your amounts of TVL and the users. Yeah. Feel free to. Yeah, actually, for all these years, uh, UX side improved uh, drastically, I guess. Yeah, so for example, Rabi good, uh, implemented very good job uh, for 
uh, improve UX. Uh, so actually, end user could be able to check what they sign, uh, how they sign, and actually it, uh, improves uh, user experience at the end. Now, from another side, of course, like on infrastructure level, there is a lot of changes. And in 2020, in 2021 especially, uh, when you do, I don't know, swap uh, on DEXs, you need to pay $50, yeah? So it's kind of crazy amount uh, for a lot of people. So actually, it uh, stop a lot of people to do anything on chain. Uh, and trading is maybe one of the, like, cheapest transactions uh, on chain, yeah? Especially, like, if you're doing, like, uh, deposits or something more complicated, it cost hundreds of dollars. Uh, right now, after growth of these layer tools, uh, different scaling solutions, actually, Ethereum is much cheaper. And even if you're just trading on Ethereum, it's like $1. Uh, and if you want to do more uh, cheaper transactions, you can go to Arbitrum Optimism and do it there. And there is still a lot of problems, of course. And I guess community working on it. And we see improvement every day. So uh, in good traction for these two years. And in two years, I guess, we'll be uh, much smooth user experience uh, for DeFi users. And they can come and do it uh, much cheaper than in Trust5. I think uh, there are several. I think it's a very pertinent question. Uh, there are several areas that we can probably look at. Uh, the changes that, at least as a protocol, like uh, protocol uh, as Stata that we have implemented and some of the protocols that, that have done well. Uh, one of the things is like, as a, as a DeFi protocol, or for that matter, any type of a project, you got to be located or present where users are present, right? So distribution and enabling access for a lot of users has been one of the most important uh, uh, elements of our journey so far over the last one and a half to two years or so, uh, be it uh, positioning ourselves on Ledger, MetaMask, or some of the exchanges like OKX and uh, in the earn sections of some of the C5 platforms. That's one significant advancement that not only us, I'm sure Lido was probably the pioneer in some of those things. Uh, so a lot of other protocols have also done a, uh, taken great strides, strides in that direction. The second one is uh, abstracting out the complexities of uh, uh, DeFi elements, which is complex DeFi, encapsulating complex DeFi strategies into like a single smart contract where users can just deposit and then do a bunch of things. And the contract does a bunch of things. Uh, is what like uh, Kian protocol has done very well with regards to leverage staking and potentially leverage staking as well. Uh, so these two are, to me, most important aspects that I would say as some of the advancements in the last uh, couple of years or so. There might be something I want to add. Um, you know, Kian is a user-facing product. We're out generating Yelp for users. So there are two trends or two dimensions um, of progress and in infrastructure that I think prompted us of rethinking um, how UX should be uh, reshaped for users. First, um, interoperability. So in the past a couple of years, I think probably to um, the first half of the next cycle, interoperability is becoming a commodity. It's fast, cheap, secure. Guess none of us um, has ever heard any of the uh, well, security glitches or uh, hacks from um, other regions in the past a couple of months, this year at least, right? So security has improved um, significantly for uh, um, cross-chain communication mechanism, and it's getting a lot of cheap. So that means um, there was a chance that um, we could have learned lines between different networks, between different chains, and abstract the concept of the chains and networks from the end users. So that's what we do within QEM. We're abstracting the cross-chain communication from user and a cross-chain access region from users so that users, I mean, from a different chains, you could do the same thing without understanding what is, um, um, I mean, happening under the hood. This is one thing. The other thing is um, probably uh, modularity. So uh, what modularity helps to achieve is first, 
um, blurred lines between different networks in terms of its uh, speed. Um, it's, uh, I mean, competitive edges and the differences in the technology. Users doesn't have to care about that. And what it also does is it reduces the, um, I mean, the cost for transactions significantly, uh, making it possible for a lot of apps to do accountings on chain. For instance, we do a lot of automations. We got a, I mean, uh, record a lot of automation, uh, uh, those uh, parameters and also transaction details for users in case, I mean, user want to withdraw their assets from the platform or um, they want to trace back what happened with their I mean, assets. Now, previously we did all that off chain because uh, it was just too costly and too slow. Now with the modularity of blockchain, making it pretty cheap to uh, record those autos on chain, we make it possible. So I think these two uh, directions are something that help us I mean, increase the UX of users significantly. Actually, for us, uh, OKX, we are more like an aggregator, right? So we don't build any of the uh, protocols. Uh, but one thing that we constantly look for, I think, in terms of like uh, getting users on board with DeFi is to kind of unify the whole like DeFi experience. So in terms of um, think about you know trading on uh, Uniswap versus trading on like Curve, right? The experience is like vastly different. So what we have done is uh, we have like things like a Dex aggregator, right? Whereby uh, we give you like the best liquidity. So it's kind of like one inch, right? Uh, whereby they basically unify things like liquidity and the whole experience. So we kind of take that approach with like uh, the DeFi protocols as well. Like we integrate, the, the protocols that we integrate, we give them a whole unified uh, kind of like experience. Things like how we show the rewards, like uh, break down the different fees uh, that's involved. Uh, and also from a you know, security standpoint, how help users to evaluate the security, we integrate with like third parties, uh, such as Certic to kind of like simplify um, you know, the risk rating for like uh, some of these protocols as well, so that they understand, you know, in a single number or single like uh, digit kind of rating that, you know, how you know, risky this particular protocol is, what are the risks involved. Um, so all in all, um, like, I think what we are trying to do here is to really um, make DeFi like a lot simpler as well as, um, you know, educate users on, you know, what to exactly, um, you know, watch out for. And additionally, uh, as well, like well, we also have like a data service. It's called OK Link. Uh, it's kind of like a blockchain explorer, um, but it's mainly used for like backend kind of stuff. So we do actually monitor some of these uh, DeFi protocols uh, quite re regularly. Um, actually, in fact, like two years ago, um, you know, when Terra Luna happened, uh, OKX was the only exchange that managed to evade uh, this whole anchor uh, UST depegging situation. So um, we do have like very rigorous, uh, you know, kind of. Um, you can call it like security um, measures that we do put in behind in order to help uh, protect users. And I think that's one of the key main barriers, right? Uh, in terms of like getting users on board into DeFi is that they fear the unknown, right? They hear like these horror stories, um, things happening in the space like every month, right? And then they, they are, they're just like on the sidelines. So that's what we hope to, you know, overcome for our users. Uh, so two key things were mentioned. Uh, we need to go where users are and then data. So obviously you operate on a very large sets of data uh, based on your platforms. So what do actually users want today from blockchain and from DeFi? Uh, <laughs> Be honest, like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, like the answer is straightforward, right? Like we are, we are, if we look at the trends today, um, people are all like speculating on, you know, airdrops. Right, so uh, potential, uh, you know, upside on you know yield farming. So one one of the key uh directions that we see is um of course like Ethereum yields or native yields, right? Uh, going uh lower, uh, and that's natural, right? Um, as more um ETH goes on uh, staking, right? Uh, the yields will naturally drop. Um, but you know, with the potential of like airdrops, we do see or people are like buying into the dream, kind of like oh I I don't I don't know what's like eigenlayer's price, right? And then I'm I'm. I'm speculating or oh, eigenlayer will hit a certain you know, amount of market cap, you know, do some quick math and then like, <laughs> what's my yield kind of like? And then that's that's where you get like pendle markets, right? The point uh, markets and then with things like whale markets as well. Um, at this time, I, I do see it still continuing like that. I, I mean, as more projects like kind of like come out, um, definitely you know, it will generate more hype and then more hope within the ecosystem. And therefore, you know, if you're talking about yield farming, yield opportunities, this is still where uh, kind of the market lies. Like everyone's doing it because it simply works, right? <laughs> I guess for sustainability of our industry, actually, we need some sustainable source of yield. And of course, like staking rewards is something that proves sustainability. 
Another, I guess, yield sources is uh, DeFi, yeah? So like lending, uh, trading, uh, perp dexes, they actually create some uh, attractive sources of yield that would bootstrap TVN uh, for DeFi itself and attract more users. I think the, the answer is quite obvious. Uh, for a, for most of the crypto native audience, right? They're looking for yields and ways to sort of make uh, very easy money via airdrops, etc. But I think if we see beyond the obvious, there are several segments of users who are, uh, like for example, in some of the hyper inflating countries, they want to preserve their uh, uh, their capital. So they are getting into stable coins and some of the other uh, blue chip assets, uh, be it Bitcoin or Ethereum, or for that matter, uh, any of the tokenized versions of uh, real world assets. So that's, they are looking for preserving their wealth and capital. Uh, there are certain segments of institutional users who want to diversify uh, into uh, different segments of assets that are not highly correlated with the, uh, with the traditional uh, TradFi assets uh, or real estate for that matter. So I would say, uh, the obvious answer is like a lot of crypto native users are looking for yields and airdrops. But beyond that, I think there are multiple segments of users for which uh, crypto serves different purpose. And I hope this segments kind of increase and expand so that the overall market of uh, crypto becomes a lot bigger. Yeah, I totally echo what Igis and AG said. Because... Um, what we observed in the past um, probably eight months to 12 months was that there was a shift um, in a trend. I mean, in a sense that the way um, users are purchasing um, yields out of DeFi or the type of yields they were looking for was a little different. So if we look back by a cycle, last cycle, if you still remember Luna, um, ST Luna, what happened was um, everybody, everybody was chasing like um, speculative yield because uh, Luna generated a yield out of nothing, right? So it's 20%. People were pursuing that. Pure speculation. People were less secure. On the other hand, if we have a look at this cycle, you know, it's um, a clear chain of combination of speculative yield and sustainable and deterministic yield. These two type of yield sources are both being traced. Because uh, we talked to a bunch of um, institutions and some of the uh, retail users on our platform, we started to fi figure out that, well, the, in this cycle, because, uh, you know, most of the users in DeFi, in this cycle, they are not a new ones. They are not a newbies. A lot of them are DGEN. So they understand the underlying mechanism and risks. They tend to find some... Um, a, a, more, more certainty um, underpinning all those yield sources. So that's why what we see is, you know, Athena is one of the examples. Athena, um, they uh, build sustainable yield sources, like funny rates into the product. I, I didn't say um, that's a great product, but uh, what I, I want to say is, you know, um, yield sources, like sustainable yield sources are being recognized or being used to build into the DeFi products and it is scalable. Now, are people still looking for um, sort of uh, uh, air jobs, speculative yield sources? Definitely, everybody is. Um, the air jobs from a kelp, that's attractive. And apparently, you know, Eigenlayer and EtherFi, there are multiple layer of, I mean, speculative air jobs. That was the uh, reason they were temporarily successful. On the other hand, I do see that um, the sustainable yield sources like what Lido and uh, State are providing, I mean, the, those uh, transaction fees out of the um, um, Ethereum main net network, I think that's going to play, I mean, increasingly a foundational role. And that will account for most of the uh, yield sources in entire, in entire DeFi space. So that's my feeling. We touched a bit uh, into reward generation and mentioned that it needs new model. Uh, do you, current model is based on uh, essentially occurring rewards from uh, validating blocks on Ethereum, uh, true liquid staked assets. 
Do you believe your products can take it to the next level and increase, uh, give more uh, of a TreadFi utility in future? For me? Okay. Um, yeah, that's um, what, do I what do we strive for, actually? So, you know, uh, what we do is, um, what Yale later is doing is we consolidated the Yale source across the entire crypto space. Funding rates uh, from both DeFi and C5 LST, that's, I mean, these are the two largest yield sources that we could count on. And on top of this, you know, um, we're looking for some of the um, nascent, emerging, hot yield sources to increase the overall APY and appeal of the product to users. So the trend I see now is like um, probably the foundational yield source alone might not be attractive enough to all uh, those DGENs or a lot of OGs. There was, a, I mean, in a, a transfer consolidated a multiple layer of EO sources in an organic way and, I mean, convey all those consolidated EO sources to users. But that's uh, what we are working on to, uh, I mean, increase um, the, uh, the appeal of the products and also to increase the adoption of, let's say, uh, Stator and uh, Rapidus to ETH. Uh, Gearbox as a technology is lending infrastructure and actually agnostic uh, for different use cases. Yeah, so you can build product uh, for leveraging point that it's more for digital oriented, but same technology can be used to you know leveraging or lending against uh, different tradefi assets. So the question is only, I guess, when these tradefi assets will be tradable on chain and where there'll be high demand for it. Because as we can see, there is few products, but still demand for such kind of product from original crypto community is much lower uh, than for more crypto native uh, yield sources. But later, I guess, with some regulations, uh, fixes, uh, more liquidity comes in the market and more uh, more regular users come and use all these threat use cases. And of course, like our product in that case will be used as like uh, more uh, uh, threat fire oriented uh, lending market, yeah. Is Tether doing something? I mean, yes, gone into uh, restaking as well, but uh, when you consider protocol level, uh, did you think about some uh, new things that are upcoming, like reconfirmations or a way to increase the protocol returns for users? Um, so, as a liquid staking protocol, obviously, we are always looking for uh, ways and opportunities that enable users to sort of uh, generate these yields uh, either on their own or via some of the strategies that uh, uh, the vault providers like Kian are doing. Uh, but in general, like as a liquid staking protocol, there's very limited that, uh, that we could do. What we are thinking of is like new ways to sort of generate yields offline and bring them on chain. So we could hear some of those details as they materialize, as, as currently they are currently at a very conceptual stage for us. Yeah, but, but I think I do see that future as quite possible, especially as the crypto yields and staking yields dry, uh, dry up quite a bit. There is potential to sort of bring off-chain yields on-chain so that they are competitive on-chain as well. So in a sense, all of you uh, shape the future of liquid staked assets. Uh, but there's variety to choose now. I, I think top of the hat, we have over 50 variations of uh, liquid assets. So how do you choose since, like just for fun of it, to bring it closer to the audience. Like uh, you have a liquid staked asset which gets uh, utility on lending market. Then you have a aggregator or protocol on top that builds a yield layer uh, and then it ends up on OKX, which is a very good access point for a wide audience. So essentially you have a series of vertical integrations, but then the key is how do you choose out of this forest of assets whom to work with? Yeah, I think this, this question is very valid uh, from an exchange standpoint because like we do uh, work with like <laughs> everyone basically, right? I, I think at, at least in the top five or six, of each uh, vertical line, especially for ETH, right? Uh, and of course, like if you talk about Soul, you know, the top three, top four. Um, I, I think most importantly is that um, 
the the landscape does change like you know very quickly uh from time to time i, I think like we all can see like you know after uh restaking uh with eigenlayer had some influence over uh you know st eve's dominance right specifically with uh etherfy you know coming out from that um i think it's re to remain uh in that kind of like flexible mindset for us and then not be shut off uh from any of these like new uh innovations that we think might take off um ultimately from uh exchange uh, standpoint is that we you know, just want like users or users to access some of these products uh, ultimately. Um, and of course, like barring all the uh, due diligence uh, kind of like uh, approach, um, I think anything that we see um, uptick in and that would bring like new users on board, um, you know, coming onto the space, right? Um, definitely is something that we would want to support. So definitely things like, um, again, with like say symbiotic, right? We do see like a huge amount of like uptake from that as well. Um, you know, getting like mental uh, supported, uh, mental Eve supported, Binance Eve supported, uh, CB Eve, et cetera, right? We, are, we, we all welcome that. Even though we have our own version of like Eve as well, we also do have like ST Eve uh, on board our CX um, as well, right? So it's not really about competition. Uh, but rather about you know getting users or giving users the choice and then creating the different products that are being built on top of some of these products. Of course, like they are not not uh, all equal in some sense, right? But uh, each of them they do have their own uh, you know use cases, their own like different integrations that they work with, and uh, definitely um, you know maybe they can exist on like different chains as well these days, right? Specifically about Eve, um, so we we do like that kind of like white uh, approach uh, and not. <laughs> Uh, gatekeep our limit. Yeah, that. Uh, I guess we have two criteria. Uh, first one, risk from risk perspective, a standing market. We always need to focus on uh, security side, on node distribution, uh, on liquidity side of uh, LSTs. Yeah, uh, and that's what we are focused on the on the first place. And second place, of course, like product perspective, how much users. Uh, demand will be on this new kind of assets. Is it worth to getting some additional risk uh, to lease this asset? So yeah, these two criteria, I guess, most crucial. There is more of a question for the audience. For okay. So um, yeah, you know, we we, we work with um, everyone here. So um, I mean. I probably will. Uh, I would like to broaden this topic a little bit by bringing to the direction of risks and returns. So, uh, for years, I've been um, thinking of um, a one question: I mean, what type of yield products that could be uh, sizable, scalable in DeFi and then generate a pretty high, I mean, acceptable APY? And at the end of the day, if we look at it back. Unfortunately, I figured out, well, it was Lido. It is the Raptor Eve. It's a, not a complex um, yield generating product. It's a, a bottom layer generate, generating like 4% under current market condition, but it's the largest one. And the problem me you think, well, what is the kind of a yield product, the large yield product that people would like to have, and in which direction should we go? So. I figured out there is a, I mean, a um, differentiation in uh, appetite for risks and returns. So, uh, if we have a look at like, the user profile uh, uh, of OKX Web3 Wallet, it makes a lot of sense to me to integrate, I mean, um, us and a different LST and LRTs into OKX Wallet for users to have options. Because, uh, you know, different users just have different appetites for risks and different understanding. Of the complexity of different DeFi protocols, so I mean, if I don't understand uh, the com complex uh, underlying mechanism for DeFi, I probably will choose to go directly for I mean, reference to ETH for four percent because uh, I feel secure. And if I mean, some of the DeGens um, and people who are chasing higher APY and would like to understand and dig into the more complexity, the potential risks of products like us, they probably, I mean, will do the due diligence and come to us. So I do think, I mean, um, all those other protocols we're building are valuable and we're creating value for different, I mean, user profiles. So in your own opinion, obviously we don't have a crystal ball, but where do you see the next narrative? Previous one was in a restaking, 
but essentially uh, again got dominated by the liquid aspect. So uh, what's next in liquid staking as a narrative for our industry? Anyone, feel free to. Oh, I'm still happy. <laughs> Yeah, I would say like, you know, currently uh, might be very controversial, but uh, definitely like Bitcoin. Um, I mean, if you think about Bitcoin uh, itself, like there's like very limited like composability and programmability. And now we do see uh, it taking form and shape. Like OKX, we have been uh, investing and uh, creating like products, uh, you know, related to Bitcoin or creating infrastructure, I mean, uh, related to Bitcoin. So like Bitcoin wallets, uh, uh, explorers basically trying to unite the whole Bitcoin experience with like, you know, what people are familiar with, with like Ethereum, right? Um, so we like for, for today, like, you know, OKX Wallet is like number one in Bitcoin for that, you know, very particular reason, right? Because we do deliver that sort of like unified experience. I, I think prior to like, um, you know, Merlin, uh, B-Square Network, um, you know, uh, basically like the Bitcoin L1s or L, uh, sorry, Bitcoin L2s that are being created today, most uh, users that came in uh, post, you know, DeFi summer, they actually never have created a Bitcoin wallet before, right? Like, what is UTX or why is my address keep changing? You know, these are some of the, um, you know, questions that we did get, right, from uh, users um, in, in, in the early days. And yeah, basically we were trying to, you know, unify that. And then now I can see um, there are basically like a lot of like, um, you know, LST related to Bitcoin, right? Basically uh, being built on Babylon these days, uh, which OKX we did invest in uh, Babylon as well. Um, so we do see, uh, that direction that, you know, uh, LSTs wise, uh, there'll be you know, more assets uh, for sure, right? Um, but I, I think the most exciting part would be, you know, Bitcoin LSTs uh, coming into the play and then, um, you know, securing like some of the newer networks and allowing Bitcoin to be more programmable, more liquid. Yeah. Um, I guess uh, from my side, there will be uh, some commoditization of LSTs. So right now, I guess it's mostly uh, focus for DeFi community, uh, but later I guess we'll see more products like uh, I don't know uh, when you could could use LST as collateral and use with your uh, credit cards uh, to pay by uh, day by day exp expenses uh, and something like that. So more broader distribution for uh, not crypto native people. Uh, I think uh, obviously LSTs have solved a lot of pain and challenges for users in terms of liquidity as well as uh, uh, utility uh, for the for these tokens across DeFi protocols. I think one of the one of the key things that could be the next evolution is like the institutional adoption of uh, LSTs uh, potentially. I mean, we do see a lot of uh, crypto native institutions uh, utilizing LSTs either just to passively hold them or to uh, utilize them on DeFi protocols to generate yields. But I do see that the adoption among uh, a lot of traditional institutions when it comes to LSTs is still quite low. Uh, and we could see some adoption among the TradFi institutions and potentially ETF players in the next few years uh, or so if the LRTs don't leapfrog the LSTs and uh, get onto their radar. Uh, but yeah, broadly, I see that is one of the territories where uh, LSTs haven't really made a lot of inroads. Yeah, I echo what is said, AJ. Um, I probably want to address from a um, uh, long-term perspective, because, uh, you know, be it a BTC LRT or ETH LRT or any type of token as a collateral, I think um, LRT doesn't change its nature. So I do, I do not, I mean, foresee a lot of innovations in terms of the technology for LRT. Um, what I hope to see, actually, I can't foresee the future, but what I hope to see is um, the change in liquidity. Because uh, if we look at the uh, real value of LST or LRT, bear me um, if I'm being rude. I mean, the only um, real liquid token I see for LST plus LRT is rapid C by far. So when I, when I try to think about the value of those liquid token, really liquidity is the moat and the largest value. Without liquidity, what is the sense of having another token on top of an LP token um, or a, I mean an LP token from a, if you're mistaken, right? So liquidity, 
And what, what I would say, would like to say is, I mean, when liquidity um, changes landscape for LSD, especially for the leading ones like Rapid to ETH, the way people look at Rapid to ETH or other, I mean, major LSDs should be totally different in the way they are utilized or different. For instance, now, auto liquidity for Rapid to ETH or for any other LRTs, they were um, provided in ETH. They're not provided in stablecoin. Look at ETH. ETH is the only large mainstream token um, getting receiving an on-chain liquidity in stablecoin. It's packed with it's, it's um I mean in um uh, not packed, it's being paired with the USDC on the Uniswap, but uh, not any LSDs. So at a time. Reference to ETH or other leading LSTs or LRTs receiving sufficient stable coin denominated liquidity. That's the moment I think it's a row, will be, uh, row and the way people use it will be changed. Because uh, most likely, if there was sufficient stable coin pair liquidity for those tokens, what I'm going to do is I'm going to purchase um, reference to ETH directly, utilize it directly in the entire ecosystem. I mean, the Lido has built a super strong DeFi ecosystem. Now, there was a lot of ways to use it to generate extra yield. And for ETH, you know, if I, I, I'm a secure, I have, I mean, a, a sufficient sense of security about the reference to ETH and trust the liquidity, trust the ecosystem, what is the point of uh, me holding the ETH? So that's the direction that I would like to see. I mean, liquidity for reference to ETH. Thank you to all the panelists. We got in a bit over time. Hopefully, it was worth for you in the audience. Uh, I'll just finish it with a spicy take that uh, Ethereum liquid stake assets will power uh, liquid Bitcoin. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys.